Hello and welcome to Physionic, where we learn the body from the macro to the micro. If that's something you think you'd be interested in, then consider subscribing. Today we're going to be dissecting and examining Dr. Berg. Dr. Berg talks on autophagy and fasting, and we're gonna be dissecting exactly each point that he makes throughout a particular piece of content. So if you'd like to learn more on autophagy and fasting, then this is the content for you. With that said, let's jump into this examine content. We're gonna talk about the major benefits of something called autophagy and exactly what autophagy really is, okay? So in the cell, you have something called the lysosome. And lysosome is like the garbage disposal. It's like the recycler, which takes all the damaged parts and breaks it down, has all these enzymes, and then it spits it out as free fatty acids and amino acids, which are the building blocks to make body tissue. Let's discuss the first series of points. There are two primary points that Dr. Berg mentions. He mentions something called the lysosome. This is something that he incorrectly labels. Uh, the vesicle that he's referring to is the autolysosome, which is different from the lysosome because what you have is you have an initial vesicle of what's called the autophagosome. Now the autophagosome is what traps all of those components that he's talking about, the different organelles, the different uh, broken proteins that need to be broken down into their constituent parts, which is the second part that he mentions. Then you have the lysosome that binds or fuses with that autophagosome, which creates the autolysosome. Now from there, then you have his second point. His second point is that you're breaking the, the, that fusion of the lysosome or what's inside the lysosome is a bunch of enzymes and he's right about that. So you have a bunch of pepsidases, you have uh, different enzymes and of course you also have uh, a lowered pH, so an acidic environment which lends to a better capability for the autolysosome to then break down the different organelles and those larger proteins into smaller parts. And he mentions amino acids as well as free fatty acids. And that part of what he mentions is actually correct. Well, that's exactly what autophagy is, which it takes garbage and makes it into new good uh, raw material so you can then build new cells. So it's very anti-aging. It's very good to protect the brain cells, to regrow new brain cells and nerve cells. It's great for the heart to regrow new um, heart cells. So it's very protective against the immune system as well. Moving on to the next segment. He talks about autophagy in terms of a recycling system. I think that's actually a pretty good way to go about trying to understand autophagy. So it is a recycling system. The second point he makes is related to that recycling analogy. And essentially what autophagy does, and he mentions this, is it does keep the cells more viable. It keeps them functioning properly. Otherwise, if you didn't have this autophagy system, then you have the buildup of many different malfunctioning proteins. And he actually touches on that a little bit later on. Now, the third point that he mentions is talking about uh, cardiomyocytes, which are heart cells. And he says that you can grow new cardiomyocytes. Well, there's very little evidence, uh, really, if any evidence that cardiomyocytes can be grown at least in a physiological state. So that might be possible in vitro, so in a petri dish, but it is not possible when we're talking about an in vivo system, talking about uh, your body. So is your heart going to grow? Is it going to grow in the sense of adding more cells, having the mitotic uh, tissue? No, uh, because your cardiac tissue, your heart cells, are what's called post mitotic, meaning that they've differentiated, they've split into, split into their designated uh, system. So they are heart cells and they will remain heart cells and they also don't split into more heart cells. So they stay stagnant. And of course you need that autophagy system within them to keep them functioning as they should be functioning. But in terms of creating new cells from that and having autophagy have a role in that, uh, specifically for those heart cells, uh, the answer is no. So what it'll do, it'll take defective damaged parts, push it into the garbage disposal, 
and intracellular pathogens like microbes and fungus and yeast and uh, viruses and all sorts of things and it's going to recycle that in this powerful lysosome. Now the next point that he makes is related to autophagy and its antifungal, antiviral, antipathogen in general uh, effects. So does it have some sort of immune function within a particular cell? So when you think of, of immunity you're thinking of cells themselves going around and destroying pathogens within the bloodstream, within the lymphatic tissue, things of that nature. But within a single cell does autophagy lead to kind of an immune system uh, within the cell? And the answer is yes, he's actually right about that. So uh, if you have pathogens that enter your cells, if that's a virus, if that's a bacteriophage, if that's a bacteria, you're going to have this autophagy system that's going to be involved in destroying those pathogens. Now that's not always the case because what you need is what's called toll-like receptors. Now you have these toll-like receptors on the outside of your cells, but you also have them on the inside. So when something is endocytosed, when it's taken into the cell, uh, you have these toll-like receptors within these vesicles that surround the object that you've just endocytosed, taken in, so like a virus. And if those TLRs, those toll-like receptors, recognize the virus, then you have this lysosome come in and bind with it and surprise, surprise for that virus, suddenly its environment has completely changed and turned into an incredibly hostile environment, which then eventually leads to the death of that virus, if you can call it a death considering there's debate if a virus is actually alive. So he is absolutely correct about that mechanism. And then we have something called misfolded proteins. Now what does that mean? Well, in your body you have all these structural parts. You have um, different parts of the cell and they're all different types of combinations of proteins. They basically have different shapes. So when these proteins are not shaped correctly, that would be called a misfolded protein, okay? And those build up, they accumulate, and they develop into this bigger piece of protein called amyloids, okay? Amyloid deposits um, are what you see in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, Parkinson's, uh, a lot of times you see it in diabetics with the arteries, cataracts. There's a whole bunch of diseases called amyloid diseases in which this kind of placking or protein placking plugs up the body, okay? And those are basically just accumulation of misfolded proteins. And these proteins can be very, very toxic, okay? So your cells can take these, recycle them into new raw material that can then be uh, used for rebuilding. The next topic that he discusses is misfolded proteins. Now there are situations in which your cells uh, create an incomplete protein, a misfolded protein in which it enters a particular organelle known as the endoplasmic reticulum and then there it ends up being shipped to the Golgi apparatus. Now after it's left those organelles or at least left the ER, uh, what you find is that sometimes the proteins aren't folded correctly or they're not folded into their correct structure. So then they can accumulate if you don't have this autophagy system. So he's correct about that. Now if that adds to amyloid plaques, he's talking about different uh, diseases that have this excretion or this release of these many, many different misfolded proteins that clump together and create amyloid plaques. Now there's a lot of debate on that if that's necessarily true, but I think we can say with some certainty that it certainly contributes. So I think in that regard he is correct. Now touching a little bit more on that, he does mention that autophagy then takes up those misfolded proteins and again breaks them down into those smaller parts, those amino acids, those fatty acids. And these amino acids and fatty acids are recycled, and this is kind of the theme that he mentions throughout the content, that uh, then they can be used for cellular remodeling. So they can be reused and resynthesized into a different type of protein or the same protein or some other functional unit within the cell. So all of that is absolutely correct. So the question is what would cause an accumulation of these misfolded proteins which would be damaged to the mitochondria coming from high levels of oxidative stress, usually from high insulin, okay? And I've done videos on this before. We talk about the connection between insulin resistance, which is high insulin or high insulin, 
and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Well, this is why, because of these proteins that get uh, shaped incorrectly and they plug up the whole system. His next point is related to misfolded proteins coming from high insulin. Now here is certainly where his bias comes in. I don't know where he got that from. To be completely honest with you, uh, high insulin over time chronically is certainly going to be an issue just in general, just because you are getting this influx of glucose, meaning that you're in a high energy state constantly. So in that way, I can somewhat understand, meaning that the glucose is then gonna go into the mitochondria, and then he also mentioned something along the lines of oxidative stress. Now, when you have glucose going through the mitochondria, which is again going to be due to this insulinogenic state, then you have oxidative stress because you're going through the electron transport chain. In simplified terms, because you have high insulin, you're gonna have more glucose entering the cells or theoretically you should have more glucose entering the cells, therefore you have more oxidative stress through the mitochondria. So that makes some sense, but uh, I would argue that in a high fat state, you would have more oxidative stress mainly because per mole, per molecule of uh, fatty acid, you're going to have far, far more activation of that electron transport chain in the mitochondria than you would with a single mole of glucose. So if that's his thought process, it makes absolutely zero sense. I would certainly argue that misfolded proteins are more common from mutations. So if that's some sort of deletion in the genetic code, if that's some sort of skipping of the genetic code, if that's some sort of transposon, meaning a movement of the genetic code from one area to another area where it's not supposed to be. So those kinds of things can lead to mutations that can eventually lead to misfolded proteins. So you're reading the script, the blueprint of your DNA, and you get to a point and it's not finished. So then you have this polypeptide chain because you're gonna have mRNA, and then from mRNA it's going to be spliced. Now that splicing can be another reason why you might have uh, misfolded proteins, but I'm not gonna get into that right now because this isn't a cell biology uh, course. But you have all these different reasons from the genetic level to the mRNA level, and then you have this uh, polypeptide chain that isn't complete. So then your chaperone proteins are going in there and trying to fold it correctly, but there isn't enough of that protein, or maybe there's too much of that particular amino acid chain leading to a polypeptide chain that ends up unfolded or ends up partially folded or completely misfolded in terms of it's folded completely but it's not folded the way that it should be. So I would tend towards the uh, argument that you're getting misfolded proteins from particular mutations and certainly other reasons as well. But the oxidative stress, certainly that could be a contributor that could lead to potential mutations but uh, high insulin, I just don't see it. And of course, the biggest thing that will trigger, the most potent thing that triggers autophagy is fasting and intermittent fasting, okay? Another reason why you need to start doing intermittent fasting, it's the most powerful thing because it corrects insulin resistance, it keeps insulin down, and it'll start to trigger this survival mechanism. It's counterintuitive. You would think if you're not eating or you're fasting, you're just gonna starve and deplete your body, but it goes in reverse. It goes into this protect mode and enhances your survival. Very counterintuitive. And his final point is talking about fasting and how fasting can lead or is a potent driver of autophagy. I do agree with him there. So if you were to fast, if that's intermittent fasting and certainly if you do extended fast, if you kind of uh, go for days without eating, then your autophagy system is going to be ramped up because yes, your cells need parts, they need amino acids, fatty acids, things of that nature. So where are they gonna get it? They're gonna get it from catabolizing some of the components that aren't necessary or aren't needed in that particular uh, moment. So it's gonna go through that and then make those building blocks available to then create more or to oxidize it or whatever it is. So yes, fasting certainly does have an impact and increases autophagy. And the final point uh, of his final point that I wanted to touch on is, is fasting necessary to drop insulin? 
No, uh, absolutely not. So while you're fasting, of course, your insulin levels will be decreased, but that's within a snapshot of time. So if that's within six hours or eight hours, but if you equate conditions, and I do have an article on this, that if you equate con conditions between a intermittent fasting individual and a non-fasting individual, if both individuals have to consume the same amount of macronutrients, at the end of the day, you're going to have the same amount of insulin release. And this has been shown because again, it's shown in studies that I will have linked down below. So with that said, do you need fasting to decrease your insulin? Uh, no. Is it going to be decreased? Yes, but in the big picture of an entire day, if you end up eating the same amount of foods and the same types of foods, it's going to have no difference. So that's that, folks. Hopefully it was informative. Hopefully you learned something. I think Dr. Berg's assessment, the way that he presents it is actually quite good. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think he does a good job explaining it for the layman, but still going into a few of the details. Uh, some of his bias comes through, so I don't necessarily agree with everything he has to say, and he does get a few terms wrong. But beyond that, I think it's a relatively okay video. Uh, just as long as you don't read into the whole insulin level uh, hypothesis that he likes to throw out there. All right, with that said, I hope that I have the pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one. 